I've traveled a lot in my life, but I underestimated Japan. You will experience culture shock if you're unprepared. The thing I love most about Japan could also be its biggest problem. Japan is a completely monocultural experience. Japanese culture is Japanese culture. Although the West has been admiring anime, J pop, samurais, and sushi for decades, Japan itself borrows nothing from anyone else. They are the metaphorical cool kid at school, and they like it that way. If you're not Japanese, you may as well be from an alien planet. But this is also what makes Japan so marvelous, because you get to experience something truly original. So, do you still want to go? Then watch on, because it's a heck of a ride. The 1400 year old city of Osaka, the former capital of Japan, is one of the best places to stay, especially if your travel time is limited. It's cheaper than Tokyo, and I'm told the locals are more laid back, which is probably true, but most importantly, Osaka is strategically located as a base of operations. From Osaka, you can visit cultural sites in Kyoto and Nara that are only short train rides away. Osaka is huge, but the primary cultural center is known as Namba, intersected by the Tombori River and the famous Datonbori Bridge. This is where I stayed for most of my six weeks. On a weekend, Namba is the definitive Japanese experience, and it's so crowded, the agoraphobic should beware. <laughs> to me, Namba has crazier energy than even Tokyo, and there was never a boring moment as I explored the streets almost every night. Like has been said many times before, Japan is a culture of contrasts. Old and new kinetic pop culture and ancient tradition combine. For the pop cultural side, most people go to an area of Osaka known as Denden Town. Not only is Denden an electronics hub, but it's the area of Osaka known to host special events like cosplay parades. If you're not aware, cosplay is the global obsession with dressing up as famous TV, comic book, and anime characters. It began in Japan and it's taken over the world. In contrast to the pop culture is, of course, the ancient shrines and temples, reminding all Japanese of their heritage. I arrived at the beginning of March specifically as the best month to visit for postcard quality photographs of these temples. That's because at the beginning of March is the plum blossom season. And then near the end of March, we have the cherry blossoms or the Sakura festival of Hanami, which we'll get to later in this video. As a pro tip, if you decide to come in March, book your accommodation months in advance. Here at the beginning of my time in Japan, I took a journey over to the Osaka castle. Although rebuilt in modern times after being eradicated by US firebombing in World War II, and also having been destroyed a couple of times even before that, there's nonetheless been a castle positioned here on this spot for hundreds of years throughout the time when Osaka was the capital of Japan. Here we see the beautiful plum blossoms. If you know where to stand, you can find perfect views of the plum trees and the castle itself framed together.
Next to the castle is a former military fortress turned kind of bourgeois shopping center. I took a look around, but I had no intention of spending my life savings on kinda touristy crap. I did, however, snag the best matcha ice cream I ate on my entire trip for about 5 USD. You can buy ice cream with either light matcha or heavy matcha, and I definitely suggest to get the heavy matcha version of a cone. In all my travels, Japan has the greatest food I've ever experienced. It's like every bite is made to perfection, and that just includes the food you can buy at the local family marts and convenience stores. But whether it's slow-cooked ramen or sashimi bowls topped with fermented vegetables and raw egg, if I wanted to make a video about the food alone in Japan, it'd probably become an anthology. There were, however, a couple of things I should point out above the rest that I'll try to squeeze into this video, and the first to mention is Kobe beef, which is a given considering Osaka is fairly close to the city of Kobe. However, what I chose to eat was Matsusaka beef, which is technically raised outside of Kobe, so it's not Kobe beef necessarily, but the Matsusaka area still includes the famous black cattle known as Wagyu. All the urban legends about massaging the cows and feeding them beer and high quality oats are true, at least for the Matsusaka cows. Or so I was told. I ate my Matsusaka beef at Yakiniku M, a famous restaurant near the Dotonbori Bridge. A serving of three high quality cuts ran about 100 USD. And like other grill restaurants, you cook the steak yourself on the hot pot. And boy was it worth it. I'd gladly spend this much money again for the most tender beef imaginable. This really is the definition of the Japanese obsession with perfection. The beef was perfect and there was nothing else quite like it. I asked about a popular dessert to eat afterwards, so I went back on the street and found this type of rice cracker ice cream sandwich. This was at a street cafe called Oshigedaki, and I'm not sure the name of this dessert, but like everything else in Japan, it was meticulously crafted to perfection. It was a little cold for it to hit the spot in the cold weather, but I could definitely appreciate it. Other must-try food included Japanese curry, and the most affordable local hangout I found for curry was a restaurant called Koko Ichibanya that serves gourmet curries without breaking the bank. On a scale based purely on taste, this chain restaurant maybe was the best. Osaka has plenty of its own specific cuisine too. There are two dishes that are the most famous in Osaka, takoyaki and okonomoyaki. Let's look at the first one. Tako means octopus and yaki simply means fried. But it's not just fried octopus, it's actually doughy balls with octopus planted inside. The dough balls are covered with ingredients like ginger, green onion, and flakes of fried tempura, then served with barbecue sauce or Japanese mayonnaise. Is takoyaki good? Uh, I guess so. It depends a lot on where you get it. God knows how much of it I ate, including takoyaki I made myself at takoyaki cooking parties at various hostels. But altogether, I liked okonomoyaki more. This is a Japanese pancake, and okonomoyaki literally means grilled as you like it. Kinda sounds like Burger King's have it your way. Typically though, it consists of a base of flour batter, cabbage, and whatever the restaurant wants to put on it. Maybe egg, pork, seafood, onions, fermented vegetables, who knows. In restaurants like this one, you cook your own on a hot pot.
On a quest to find the best food in Osaka, I met up with Sammy. Sammy is an Osaka expert and part-time expat from Canada. If anybody knows the city, it's going to be Sammy. We're going to a place called Kanmuria. Uh -huh. It's one of my favorite places to hang out, have a snack, get a couple of drinks in. And through Sammy, I was introduced to the magic of izakaya restaurants. Izakayas are street-side bars, sometimes just with a bar counter and a few seats, and they're social places to unwind after work, with a bartender slash chef on hand to cook basic dishes to serve, usually with a mug of beer. <laughs> Most izakayas I went to were definitely social and I found myself talking to large amounts of locals. And not surprisingly, the cheapest local food turns out to be the best tasting. Sammy took us to an izakaya near the Dobutsuin station in an older, rustic area of the city. This bar was filled with locals, music memorabilia, pop culture artifacts like Iggy Pop dolls, and this really cool guy I got to know during my time in Osaka. And then, <laughs> For a couple of dollars, you can buy food like this homemade okonomoyaki that was better than the expensive stuff at the big restaurants. Everything else on the menu kicked butt too. The drawback to these places is there can be a lot of smoking in tight-knit quarters, and if you're a vegan, you might be out of luck. But the izakaya represents something deeper than just the food. It's a place for the overworked, stressed Japanese working class to try and relax. In a culture as lonely as Japan, sometimes something so simple is the best thing to look forward to at the end of the day. Getting to know locals, I became quite aware of the issues of being overworked in Japan, with white-collar businessmen sometimes clocking in as many as 16 hours a day for their companies. It's a constant topic of discussion, and there seems to be an increasing desire among the Japanese for more personal freedom. If you're curious about this izakaya, here is roughly where you can find it on a Google map. Overall, this area became my favorite part of Osaka. That is, the district of Shinsekai accessed from the Dobutsuen station. From the old streets around the surrealistic red light district that I don't have any photos or videos of for obvious reasons, to the Hallmark Osaka Tower, which is a 103 meter former broadcasting station and now a tourist trap, this whole area is a bit cheaper, a bit more laid back, but still with many options to see and explore. I stayed out here for two weeks in a hostel called Hotel Toyo that even includes its own private rooms for cheap, making for some of my best memories in Japan. No time in Japan would be complete without taking a day to experience some true Japanese cultural types of things. And so I met some locals and found myself at a arcade in Namba. And we indulged in what I could only describe as things that locals like to do. And that includes photo booths which are kind of designed for females in mind, especially given the end result of the photo booth is that your picture becomes glossy looking, full of makeup, and you get imprinted with bright pink lipstick. But hey, if you want a true Japanese cultural experience, you definitely should check out some of the arcades. 
For all of Osaka's sights, most visitors pick Osaka as a waypoint to other destinations as well. And if you're coming to Osaka, you'll probably find yourself also going to Kyoto and Nara. I could do other shows about these destinations, but I can point out one of the coolest places in Japan is the Fushimi Inari Shrine on the outskirts of Kyoto and accessible by train from Osaka. It takes an hour 15 minutes to get there, but I suggest leaving on the first train at 5am to arrive well before the crowds. Built many centuries ago in devotion to the rice goddess Inari, this shrine park features the famous 1000 gates, beautiful orange arches spreading all the way up to the top of the mountain. Along the way are also hundreds of small shrines to various spiritual entities. It really is the ultimate Japanese spiritual pilgrimage whether you believe in Shintoism or not. I was curious how the shrine is maintained. I came to find that as old as Fushimi Inari is, the hundreds of giant bamboo columns are periodically refurbished or replaced. This also gives a chance for businesses to donate new columns as a way to bless their company with good fortune. In fact, every column in the ancient shrine has the name of a business inscribed on it and this tradition has been going on for centuries. In Japan, it would seem that ancient traditions and common sense business plans mix together. So because the Fushimi Inari Shrine is uh, in dedication to a goddess of rice, uh, it is a place that people go to seek prosperity with their businesses. And so, of course, uh, I brought one of my business cards and so I will, of course, add it to the shrine here, one of the shrines. There's actually like hundreds of shrines in this huge park, um, but this is a more impressive one I found. And as you can see, there's a lot of people put their business cards here. I assume they're seeking blessings. It's a very Japanese way to find success, I suppose. There we go. See if we can kind of stick this in right. Right in there. There you go. So, uh, yeah. We'll see if the uh, goddess of rice is uh, favorable to me. The next must-see destination is an old capital of Japan, even older than Osaka, which is the glorious city of Nara. The city of Nara blends the most ancient of historical roots with a nice, small, but modern destination. I stayed in the Nara Visitor Center in N, in the center of town, which I highly recommend. From there, I went out to explore the city. They talked about deer living in Nara, and they were not joking. And it's not just any deer, but sacred deer. At the Kasuga Teisha Shrine, a deity is said to exist that rides upon a deer. To keep this deity pleased, for the last 1400 years, deer have been allowed to wander a large expanse of Nara, learning over that time how to outsmart tourists and steal food not unlike groups of monkeys. Among the beautiful sights of Nara, most people will choose to see the mighty Taidoji Temple, easily one of the most impressive temples in the world, and once the magnificent heart of Japan's old capital, and still today the largest wooden building in the world, which also houses the largest bronze Buddha in the world at 49 feet. 
From Taidoji, I wandered down to the Kasuga Teisha Shrine, where the deity of the deer is said to haunt. This is a very beautiful park, and if you come around Sakura season, you'll find the cherry blossoms surrounding the path close to the city as you walk. Along with the Fushimi Inari Shrine, this had to be one of my favorite spots in Japan. Returning to Osaka, I knew I needed to check off one last thing on my to-do list, which was a return to Osaka Castle during the cherry blossom viewing of Hanami. To my disappointment, few blossoms surround the castle grounds itself. However, the Osaka Castle Park beneath provides some of the best viewings in the city. Plus, a couple of good trees in line to the castle itself make for excellent postcard quality photos. Soon my time in Japan did come to an end, and so it was time to fly to Vietnam for my next adventure. For everything that's amazing about Japan and the western prefectures that we talked about in this video, I can't complete this guide without two notes of caution. Firstly, it's a hard place to visit. I studied Japanese in college, and so I had an upper hand, but so few people speak English that learning some basic phrases is recommended. And fortunately, Japanese is significantly easier than Mandarin and other Asian languages, and so learning some Japanese can be a fun and also necessary experience. And as a second note of caution, I don't think it's wise to view Japan with rose-colored, or should I say sakura-colored glasses. If you plan to move to this country, understand that many of the expats I met from all over the world, in Japan teaching English or involved with other business ventures, expressed frustration to me about living in the country long term. While Japan is a beautiful country that I'll probably keep visiting throughout my life, I also have to keep my expectations in check compared to when I was a bit naive in my college years and I thought maybe I would go and live in Japan the rest of my life. The Japanese themselves will be the first to tell you that there are societal issues and they're still being dealt with, and I think foreigners need to be aware of these things. But then again, life is about contrasts, just like Japan is. And sometimes even the most beautiful places can have darker sides as well. And it's interesting that this could be the lesson I learned from my time in glorious Nihon. Well, that's it for this video. Hope you guys liked it. Please hit that subscribe button, punch that notification bell, punch that like button if you enjoyed this guide. Leave some comments down below, tell me what you thought, and stay tuned for the next videos coming up as I explore places like Hanoi, Vietnam. Okay guys, I'll see you soon.